Are we live? Brilliant. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to um, our fifth session of Neuromatch 4. So we're in day two, session two, in case you've lost the plot already. Um, and it's our final keynote talk. Um, things go fast. <laughs> Um, so I'm Jenny Bisley, for those of you who don't know me, and I am really delighted to be hosting uh, Dr. Athena Akrami this evening, uh, or this morning, depending on where you are. So <laughs> Athena is a, a group leader at the Sainsbury Welcome Centre for Neural Circuits, based here at UCL. Um, prior to that, she was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Fellow at Princeton, working with Carlos Brody. Um, and I think what's really outstanding about Athena's work is her ability to combine computational methods with behavior and systems neuroscience approaches for really kind of, um, you know, engaging in this kind of iterative cycle of, of modeling and experiments. Um, so I'm super excited to hear her talk. I'm gonna hand the floor over to her. Her talk's titled, The Formation and Updates of Sensory Priors in Working Memory and per Perceptual Decision-Making Tasks. Before I do, I will just remind you, um, if you want to ask a question, please use the Ask a Question tab. Um, and, I'm going to hand over to Athena. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and all the Neuromatch organizers. It's a, it's an honor to be here and uh, talk to you tonight or this morning. Thank you so much uh, for the intro, too. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, as Jenny said, it's kind of a cycle back and forth between the experiments and model to try to understand um, something about how we basically kind of uh, learn implicitly uh, and, and that kind of implicit learning can impact our working memory and uh, further down the line, our decision-making processes. To start with, let me present you some sort of a, hopefully kind of a uh, fun clip to maybe a little bit wake you up. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not seeing your faces, I hope this works. So I'm going to play for you a distorted sound. Just listen to this clip. Okay, probably you didn't really comprehend anything out of this. Now, let's listen to this one. The texture of experience is prior to everything else. Okay, now let's go back to that distorted sound. Okay, so again, I'm not seeing your faces. I hope this works, meaning that um, after presentation of the clear um, uh, voice, voice clip, you could then uh, going back to the distorted one, you could anchor yourself to some familiar patterns in order to denoise and disambiguate that distorted voice, right? So I presented this as a kind of a simple example of how basically kind of as we navigate in the environment, there are a lot of occasions that we deal with noisy and ambiguous um, situations, right? And we always use our prior knowledge, even if we are completely unaware of that in order to kind of denoise these situations. So the question is that how we basically kind of um, acquire these big uh, 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 body of knowledge throughout our life um, in a, that most of it basically is unsupervised, right? And implicit, meaning that our brains, um, they evolutionarily speaking, they are evolved to be sensitive to regularities um, around us, right? That they are relevant to us. And most of these regularities, they unfold over time. And when the brains need to kind of learn these, uh, these regularities over time, they basically kind of use our working memory in the back of our mind in order to piece together events, right? Like now that you are listening to me and hopefully my speech is comprehensible for you, the reason is that even if you are unconscious about this, your working memory of different time scale is working in order to piece together for you the, the kind of words that I'm spitting out from which you can infer my previous sentences, my previous paragraphs, and the gist of what I'm trying to say, right? And you may also wonder how uh, uh, babies, in the first place, they learn language, right? So use of language is something, and then learning of the language in the first place is something else, right? So. Baby, babies, when they get to the age of about around seven, eight months, they can um, kind of start to um, 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 learn the syntactic structure on the line language, right? And meaning that they have the, the brain has the right hardware 
in order for them to start um, um, in a completely unsupervised uh, manner, meaning without any kind of um, uh, explicit instruction or explicit reward, they kind of learn um, the syntactic structure. What are the phonemes? What are the where are the word boundaries? And what is the relationship between between the uh, the words? Right. So the question that we are trying to kind of tackle in our lab is basically kind of how does the brain learn this complex but the structural uh, regularities that most of the time they kind of uh, unfold over time, right? And we kind of know that there is, um, uh, we use our working memory and here I'm really using the working memory in a very loose um, uh, way. Maybe it kind of would make some of the human cognitive scientists angry, but by working memory, I mean some internal representation of our external world. And after that, we kind of extract something abstract out of this internal representation and we use that 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 abstract knowledge um, um, and kind of discard the rest of it right so this is what i mean by working memory and we we our brain um, uses this working memory in order to kind of learn regularities and the interesting thing is that once we learn regularities they kind of impact our working memory down the line so imagine that I ask you to remember a set of words. I think you all agree that remembering gibberish is way more difficult than remembering coherent sentence. Why is that? Because in remembering coherent sentence, again, we anchor ourselves uh, via these learned regularities into some familiar um, old prior knowledge in order to kind of remember things, right? So in the lab, we try to kind of utilize um, um, uh, rats, mice, human subjects, and computational models in order to study different kind of um, uh, tasks that um, uh, fall underlying this kind of uh, this interaction between these two faculty of our, our, our mind, working memory and learning regularities. Some of them are very similar to the example of the language, which is just like abstract learning of temporal patterns in a completely implicit way. Um, some of them are related to kind of learning some variables that have some sort of a, a probabilistic distribution, for instance, like the, um, um, learning the, the, the distribution of the height of the people around you, right? Which is just like, it's not that you sit down and, and put down uh, um, uh, individual heights and you kind of measure the, uh, the, uh, the distribution in a very uh, direct mathematical way. No, we just like, by uh, observing, people around us, we kind of form some, some um, belief about the distribution of the height of people around us. How do we do that? How are we sensitive to these variables around us that have this probabilistic um, uh, nature? And we try to really kind of study this type of behaviors related to learning regularities and learning um, uh, prior uh, knowledges in tasks that are um, would allow us to basically kind of uh, parse out different phases of the of the behavior in tasks that we call them parametric. For instance, like parametric working memory. Okay, and uh, at first glance they may appear very kind of uh, unnatural, but and I, I agree with that. We kind of kind of a trade off between. Uh, trying to kind of make the task more um, controllable, right? We know that what are the different phases of the task, meaning that what is the sensory encoding, what is the memory maintenance, what is the, what is the decision making part. And uh, so, as I mentioned, then we try to really kind of combine uh, various levels behavior in human and rodents, mice and, and rats in high throughput basically system with um, uh, various techniques to look into the brain and perturb different levels of neural um, dynamics in the brain together with different types of, of models, either mechanistic kind of neural network model or more normative models or dynamical system model in order to kind of understand and build a multi-level understanding of, of inference and learning basically in this type of temporally extended task. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, um, um, this, this specific um, notion of parametric working memory and how we can kind of tap into some understanding of learning priors and use of that in the in-working memory. So, as I mentioned, we would like to have tasks that would give us this ability to uh, disambiguate and deconfound sensory coding from memory maintenance from decision making. And a very classic example of that is the work of uh, Rolando Romo in monkeys, um, either in tactile or, or auditory domain, 
where, for instance, in the tactile animals, we're receiving pulses, um, like trains of pulses on the fingertips. And these train of pulses, they have different frequencies, like right, SA and, and, and SB. And they are separated by a, a certain delay interval. And the animal needed to basically compare the frequency of the second stimulus with the memory of the first one and then make a decision. OK, this task, uh, you may find it um, uh, strange, but didn't exist um, until in 2014. Uh, together with uh, Ayash Vasehi and Matthew Diamond at CISA, we developed this, this task for the first time in tactile domain um, uh, for rats. And then after I joined Carlos Brody at Princeton, I translated it into um, uh, auditory domain. So it's basically a presentation of two stimuli, right? Two sequential stimuli. First a stimulus, second a stimulus, separated by a delay interval. And this delay interval can be as short as 100 milliseconds or as long as 20 milliseconds. And then while we are kind of basically looking into the brain or, or um, um, uh, perturbing the brain during the memory, we are kind of sure that this whatever neural representation that correlates with the task, it's most likely correlates with the, with the um, memory of the first stimulus. And it's not kind of confounded with the uh, motor planning or future choice of the animal because the animal has not yet received the second stimulus. Okay. So uh, a kind of a closer um, uh, presentation of the, of the, of the uh, task in, in rodents. This is a top view, schematics of the top view of the task. So there is an um, a occurring conditioning a chamber. The animal, it, it has like three pokes. The animal pokes in the center, receives a sound. This is like a kind of a noise sound, uh, meaning that at each moment in time, amplitude of the sound comes from a Gaussian distribution. And by changing the variance of the Gaussian distribution, we basically are modulating the amplitude of the noise of the sound. So it, it is presented for 400 milliseconds. There is again a variable delay interval, second stimulus, and then go cue. And following the go cue, the animal can withdraw, go to the left or right side of the box in order to receive the reward. And the way that we are delivering reward depends on the relationship between the two stimuli. Okay. And we have basically equivalent tasks for humans, both in auditory and tactile domain. OK, so let's now dig a little bit into kind of the nature of this type of working memory task. So as I said, we present subjects with the first stimulus that has a certain amplitude, right, SA. And then after a certain time, we present them with the second stimulus, OK? And what we ask them, we ask them to basically, uh, we expect subjects to compare uh, the second stimulus with the memory of the first stimulus, right? But memory is inherently noisy. So our brains, the brain of this little guy, as well as our human subjects, can either kind of give up to this noisy representation of memory or somehow cheat in a smart way. Meaning that, Imagine that the animal, after many exposure to different stimuli, beats some sort of a prototype sound. What is the most likely sound that can happen in this, in this context? And then um, in this kind of a dimension that kind of represents loudness of the sound, when um, um, the actual sound uh, falls somewhere here, and then if it kind of gets noisy, it may just like randomly move around and fade even, Instead of that, this sound may kind of contract toward this prototype sound, which is which can be built by looking at the recent history of the sound. Okay, so what I am depicting here is a very kind of a uh, Bayesian and maybe optimal strategy of dealing with noisy memory. Okay, meaning that we build this kind of a prior. Uh, what is the what is the most typical sound, and we basically kind of snap our noisy memory into that in order to denoise it. Okay. And this, uh, for the first time, was uh, um, uh, discovered by an American um, uh, psychologist, Hollingworth. Um, uh, and I really recommend kind of reading um, his, his um, early, um, early works in various types of human psychophysics experiments. And particularly, he is the one who saved um, uh, Coca-Cola for Americans, because when Coca-Cola came out, it had a really high content of caffeine and regulatory agencies. They wanted to ban it because of that this high level of caffeine. But then Coca-Cola kind of hired Hollingworth um, and asked him to, can you please kind of tell these people that 
there is nothing harmful in, in Coca-Cola. And Hollingworth ran really meticulous, very beautiful um, psychophysics, various types of measurements um, that would kind of show that if anything, there is actually benefit in, in having um, uh, caffeine. So, and he basically kind of discovered this um, 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 phenomenon that it's been called various names. One of them is contraction bias. You can you can find it in um, under the name of assimilation to context or order effect, different different names. But it basically means that the perceived value of items held in working memory, they contract toward the mean of the prior formed by all the stimuli being used in the in the task. And this has been then since then replicated in various modalities in different tasks, mainly in humans. So if we go back to our task, um, we can kind of uh, try to um, 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 imagine what is the possible way of contraction bias showing itself in the task. So here we are presenting again the stimulus set, first stimulus, second stimulus, diagonal means they are equal. And the color here shows the difficulty of the comparison task, right? So these two, like the, the memory of the first stimulus needs to be compared to the second stimulus. The closer to the diagonal, the more difficult this comparison. And here the vertical line shows basically the mean of the stimuli, okay? So under the assumption of contraction bias, if you have one pair of stimuli like this, uh, the memory of the first stimulus will move toward the mean, toward this vertical line. And by virtue of that, that's going to get close to the diagonal and the, 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 the comparison task becomes more difficult. But then we do have other pairs like this one here that by, by going and by uh, moving the basic the memory of the first stimulus toward the, the vertical line, it's going to go away from the diagonal and the comparison task becomes easier. So then we can kind of divide all these um, stimulus uh, set into different areas that we can call them bias plus, where contraction bias is kind of beneficial to the task, and bias minus, where contraction bias is actually kind of detrimental to the, to the behavior, right? And we can particularly have some sort of a psychometric pairs of stimuli where we are manipulating the difficulty by um, changing the, the, the basically distance to the diagonal. And all of these psychometric pairs are now basically sitting in the bias minus region. That's kind of important because I will get back to that point later. Okay, so here is what we are presenting, the set of the stimuli that we are presenting during each session to our animals. Uh, so uh, all intermingled within one session. Also, there is, as I mentioned before, a variable delay interval. When we first look at the average performance over um, uh, all pairs of stimuli for different delay intervals, one kind of um, things that, oh, uh, it seems that working memory behavior here is pretty stable from two seconds of delay interval to 12 seconds. But it's kind of cheating, and I will get back to that later, because it's very important to break down the performance for individual pairs and then look at some patterns that emerge, meaning that, look at here, the performance here is much worse than here, right? As we move this way, the performance decreases, and performance here is much worse than here. And we basically, as we move here, performance gets worse. And this is basically also very similar to what we found in the human subjects, right? Again, asymmetry of performance at the edges and also as we move um, uh, from a smaller value of SA to longer value of SA, the um, um, uh, performance gets worse and the other way around for second stimulus. And that's very similar, at least eyeballing on the data to uh, what we kind of qualitatively described for the effect of contraction bias, okay? But we can go beyond just like eyeballing on the data and find some kind of qualitative similarities. We can basically kind of pull out this impact of, of um, uh, a mean of the uh, prior uh, stimuli as well as other components in the task by building a very simple regression model. Okay, so here the regression model assumes that uh, the final choice of the animal is impacted by um, um, sensory inputs from the current trial, as A and as E of the current trial. We can, be, we can have some bias turn, but also some history impacts in, 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 um, parameters, meaning that sensory stimuli from one trial back, from two trial back, we can include also the reward 
history biases. This is something very well known that like uh, previous choices and previous rewards is that use um, um, are going to basically impact the future choice of, of subjects, animals or humans. Meaning that if someone goes, ch chooses right and then gets rewarded on the right side, there is a higher chance of repeating the right um, a choice again in the future trial. And then we can also include some sort of a long-term mean, which is basically a kind of a um, uh, exponential window that integrates all the past stimuli and form this kind of a mean of, of uh, previous stimuli. And then we can basically fit the exponential of that um, of that exponential um, window, the time constant of the exponential window, and find basically how different subjects are integrating the past. And the ideal performance on this task would have basically all the history terms, right? The weights for the all the history regressors, zero, and as well as the bias, the only non-zero terms would be the weights for the current stimuli, right? So uh, equal with opposite sign. That's enough and that's ideal to perform the comparison task. But uh, nothing is ideal in, re in real world. And when we compare here, basically these are your kind of, um, you don't really need to understand these plots completely. I'm here showing the coefficients um, um, uh, for uh, like the stimuli for the first, um, for the current trial for rat subjects, human subjects. And the take home message of that is first, rat and human are pretty similar to each other when you look at different kind of a weights for, uh, from this model fit. And then second, there is a, here we are showing the history signal, right? Weights from the history um, 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 coefficients, meaning that the, the weights- Tina, sorry to interrupt you. I, we can't Sorry. see your mouse. I don't know whether you want to sort of change oh. it to a laser pointer. Um, how can I do that? So, are you are you in PowerPoint or as a PDF or keynote? I am in PowerPoint. I think if you hover in the left hand corner, you should get a little menu and you can right click usually to um, change it to a laser pointer and then hopefully we'll be able to see it. Um, OK, OK. Do you see that now? No. No, sorry. I am sorry. Um, then I don't know how to do that. There's... I mean, you can probably just describe where you are. I just didn't want yeah, you to be exactly. thinking you're yeah, pointing sorry. at stuff. Really yeah. Unless anyone out there knows. Uh, full screen, really? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry, strange. just seeing if anyone's got any ideas, but um, um, it doesn't seem like it. It is PowerPoint and I don't see that option here. There is like, I can choose a pen, but that's different, but I can't really choose a, I don't know whether on Mac things are weirder. I'm so sorry. So I was basically pointing at, uh, oh, that's then difficult. Um, at this um, left bottom plots, which are, I'm showing basically the, uh, the weights for um, 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 the, um, you see the X axis as weight values. And then where there is a red box, it's basically showing the, the uh, weights, significant weights uh, from uh, the model feed we, uh, for the sensory, uh, for the um, um, stimuli from one trial back, for instance. And as you see, again, um, uh, um, a lot of the subjects, they have um, 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 significant non-zero values of the sensory history term, and human and rats are very similar to each other. And when we basically summarize, uh, look at the summary of, the, of, of um, 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 sensory history versus reward history in this purple versus green um, uh, plot in the middle down, you see that both of them are um, um, non-zero, but the sensory history part, uh, part is basically kind of ways um, uh, larger in this, in this um, uh, behavior. Okay, another interesting thing, uh, this uh, plot on the 
uh, lower right part is that, um, as I said, we can kind of fit different exponential windows with different um, time constants. And uh, when we look at a tau for best fit for the individual rats, it seems that we get, kind of get a bimodal distribution of rats, meaning that some rats, it seems they are kind of integrating over hundreds of trials and some of them are integrating over kind of a tens of trials, which is very interesting, which I kind of uh, dig into that more now. Okay. So we have a behavior. It seems that we can show that in this working memory task, parametric working memory task, um, um, working memory is kind of clearly impacted by the uh, uh, history of sensory events as well as reward events um, um, uh, in the task. So what can we kind of um, 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 say about the, about the brain? And so from the literature in, in primate and human, we already knew that like prefrontal and posterior parietal cortices are involved in working memory, but are they also involved in parametric working memory of graded sensory uh, stimuli? That was not clear. And particularly um, in broadened studies, um, uh, when you look at the kind of previous works that they, they are not basically explicit um, working memory tasks, but they are perceptual tasks that rely on working memory, like delayed orientation or accumulation of evidence or multisensory integration. The result coming from um, uh, PPC perturbation, PPC inactivation was very kind of confusing, sometimes no, no result, sometimes um, um, uh, impairment. So, uh, but now I'm going to show you a set of um, uh, results from optogenetic experiments and electrophysiological recordings in posterior parietal cortex of, of rodent brain that would kind of show and suggest that maybe uh, PPC is one of the nodes is involved in basically kind of integration of the memory with this prior sensory history. Okay, the first disclosure is that I'm, throughout the talk, I'm going to refer to this uh, brain area as posterior parietal cortex. But uh, the thing is that posterior parietal cortex in rat's brain, very similar to all the other species, is a really large part of the brain. And by moving like anterior to posterior or medial to the lateral part, a lot of the things change, including the connectivity with the rest of the, um, uh, the brain. So all my claims basically <laughs> apply only to a very specific um, coordinate, as I'm showing in the basically in this kind of an anatomical um, uh, uh, plot in the middle, that applies to a very specific brain coordinate. Okay. And the first set of data that I'm showing you comes from full trial inactivations with optogenetics, meaning that we have animals injected with halorhodopsin. It's an opsin. Uh, which basically has an inhibitory property, meaning that if that opsin expresses in that part of the brain and then later on we shine light, uh, we will basically reduce the activity of neurons in that in those neur in those neurons that um, have um, heterodopsin expressed. Okay, and full trial meaning that the laser is turns on as soon as the animal pokes in the center and hears the first stimulus, and then remains on throughout the trial until the animal makes a decision. Okay, so in the data plot in the in the bottom, I'm showing you that when we inactivated PPC, basically. Um, 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 we managed to remove both bias plus and bias minus. So if you compare the red, uh, sorry, the yellow bars with the gray bars, you see that under laser on condition, basically the, the both biases, they go away, okay? And when we focus on these psychometric curves, now I'm pointing at these um, a plot of SA and SB on the uh, top left corner that you see the yellow uh, psychometric curves. And in that, um, 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 would you see all the pairs of a stimuli, they are sitting on the bias minus region. And when we then look at the psychometric performance under laser on the yellow uh, versus uh, control, you see that in three animals, this um, psychometric gets sharper suggesting that the performance improves. This is something that didn't happen in the sham animals, okay? So, and that's again, consistent with the idea that, that like by PPC, it seems um, it has this both kind of a components of bias minus and bias plus. And when we kind of remove this bias minus, the performance improves. Okay, so 
And when we fit the same regression model, again, the, the finding matches the, the basically the, the, the um, behavior, meaning that uh, fitting, the, uh, fitting the model with different history parameters um, and comparing the control versus laser on trials, we found that the only regressors that whose basic coefficient change um, and they are the sensory history regressors okay and the non-sensory history regressors they remain the same okay so what happens in terms of the neural activity in ptc you may wonder at this point that we should be able to kind of decode um, um, the, the sensory history that we were observing um, on the impacting behavior and also kind of it seems kind of inactivating PPC is, is reducing that impact, we should be able to kind of decode that history um, uh, um, um, signal in the, in the parietal, uh, posterior parietal neurons. So here I'm showing you one example neuron. X-axis is time. Uh, Y-axis is, um, is um, uh, firing rate. And um, you see that and, and here we are plotting the, the firing rate in response to different levels of first stimulus. OK, so um, as you see, during the first stimulus, this neuron kind of fires the same no matter what is the sensory input. And it doesn't code the memory during the second second of delay interval. During the second stimulus, also, it doesn't show any kind of a modulation by the, by the sensory um, input. And then go cube is played, the animal makes a choice, intertrial interval starts. And now suddenly, from the firing rate of this neuron, we can basically decode what happened around 10 seconds ago, meaning that as you see the firing rate um, grouped based on the uh, SA that happened around 10 seconds ago, we can basically kind of um, 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 uh, decode um, uh, the level of, of, of stimulus. This is very interesting because it's kind of a reactivation of these sensory events many seconds later on. So if now we go back at the kind of a summary of all neurons that we recorded in this task, which are like about 360 neurons over five animals, and we look at the mutual information between the firing rate of single neurons and different task parameters. So mutual information is basically a kind of a, a tool that would tell us that if we do have two variables, X and Y, if we know X, how much our uncertainty about why is reduced, okay? So we are here, we are here we are looking at the firing rate and we want to say that by knowing firing rate of a neuron, how much we can tell about, for instance, the, the stimulus identity of the, of the current trial or the previous trial, okay? So everything non-significant is blanked out into uh, uh, blue in the, in the heat map. And there is a population of neurons during the first stimulus that kind of codes the, the, the first sensory input. Then nothing of that really uh, remains during the delay. Smaller population that again kind of keeps coding the first stimulus during the presentation of the second stimulus, kind of silent during the ITI, and then a large population of neurons. Um, again, I'm, I'm pointing at the heat map that kind of um, uh, starts uh, um, uh, having high and significant level of mutual information uh, with the um, um, SA. Okay. So summarizing uh, um, uh, these, these um, uh, heat map in the plot below, we are basically we are showing the percentage of cells with significant mutual information. Red shows the mutual information about current sensory input, SA, and blue shows the uh, mutual information about the previous trial, okay, sensory input from the previous trial. And as you can see, when the next trial, this kind of a current trial starts, there is this population of blue here that they, these are basically neurons that keep coding the still previous stimulus, not the current stimulus, okay? And if we kind of look at whether there is any, any kind of a correlation between this population here and behavior, we can simply in the bottom plot, we can kind of first um, uh, over five different animals that we had, we can uh, basically kind of sort the size of these or the amount of uh, uh, um, uh, mutual information carried by PPC uh, neurons. And you see that there is like some, some animals, they have very small amount of information, some animals have higher. And then we can go back to their behavior 
and asked how much in their behavior they are influenced by this past sensory input, right? And then there's kind of a, you get another story. And then there is a very clear, strong modulation between these uh, neurons carrying sensory history and the amount of behavioral biases that the animals show. And so here we basically look at this neural activity during this delay interval of the current trial, but now we can basically move back here, the x-axis shows different basically kind of a time epochs um, before the start of the trial. And the, if look at the magenta line here. So magenta line, it's kind of peaks during the current delay, uh, current the delay interval of the current trial, right? Between like zero to two seconds and, and then two to four seconds of the current trial, right? So, and when we, I went back and repeated basically the, the optogenetic experiments, but now focusing on different time epochs of the task, first stimulus, delay interval, or second stimulus, it seems that the, the, this impact of sharpening of the psychometric consistent with removal of the bias minus in the task happens if I perturb PTC during the delay interval. So it seems that kind of um, it's it's um, this perturbation study is basically consistent with this correlation study of the neuron and behavior that like this correlation um, is picked during the delay interval as if like somehow this history signal is integrated by the working memory sometime during the delay interval. Okay, so I have a summary here um, before moving to the kind of the next part, which is making sense of these these. Um, sensory history biases via some modeling work. So first, working memory is impacted by history of sensory events. And this is something optimal, given how noisy our memories are. And it seems that in rats, um, at least this specific coordinate in posterior parietal cortex is it's kind of a causally related to these sensory, previous sensory um, history, and represents this um, part of the sensory history. And by removing this sensory history, um, it seems that behaviorally, we can detect the impact on reduced biases, the sensory history biases. Okay, so as I said, it seems that somehow this um, um, integration of the memory and this uh, previous sensory um, 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 uh, prior history happens during the memory interval. Okay, and maybe some happens somewhere downstream of PPC. And why do I say that? I showed you some optogenetic um, experiments and also the neural correlate um, a um, a peaks during the delay. Also behaviorally, when we look at measure the bias plus and bias minus for different delay intervals, these biases increases, and they, they increase as we increase the delay interval, okay? And this is something that actually, when we look at another task that doesn't have the working memory component at all, so it's basically a sound categorization task. Rats or human subjects, um, they, they hear a sound and then they kind of need to um, uh, categorize it into something above or below a kind of an arbitrary boundary. So in this task, um, that currently is being investigated by um, uh, different people in the lab, Elena and Victor particularly, um, we, we cannot find contraction bias. There are other very interesting phenomena, uh, um, um, meaning that subjects show interesting sensitivities to the underlying the statistics of, the, of, 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 of sensory inputs, but not contraction bias. So it seems this kind of a working memory component um, is kind of um, important, and it kind of goes back to this notion of uh, maybe optimal Bayesian framework that we would like to form some sort of a prior knowledge, what is the typical sound, and we would like to somehow kind of, um, uh, um, when we recall the memory, we estimate it through this prior, and that is a more um, uh, uh, basically optimal rec a, a, a way of recalling noisy memories than just like giving up to the noise. Okay, on the other hand, I have to show, I have to say that when we look into the behavior, I briefly mentioned that when I was telling you about the regression model, that there is a, a strong bias towards very immediate past trial, okay? Meaning that here basically I'm kind of uh, quantifying the, that bias um, and uh, like the heat maps, the x-axis shows current trial, the y-axis one trial back, okay, for our humans, rats, 
and uh, in tactile domain or auditory domain. And you see there is a modulation by the Y axis, okay? Meaning that uh, uh, the memory on the, on the um, 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 stimuli and the current trial is impacted by immediate one trial back, okay? So in the bottom plot, when we look at this kind of this amount of this bias, it seems that the bias from the most immediate trial is the strongest, and then it kind of um, um, dies, and then it's even stronger than this kind of a mean of a stimuli. Okay, so how then now we, we, we can reconcile the fact that there is this very short-term history of biases toward immediate past trial, and then on the other hand, this kind of a Bayesian notion that like um, contraction bias comes from this kind of a drift of the memory toward mean of the of the uh, 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 previous experiences. So uh, in the remaining time, I'm going to briefly tell you some kind of a new insight that um, the work by uh, Vijay in collaboration with Claudia Klopas lab uh, um, is giving us, which are, is kind of, they were very surprising to me and um, um, let me walk you through that. So Vijay is modeling um, this kind of interplay between the working memory and, and um, uh, sensory history by um, having two basically continuous attractors, okay? So um, um, we do have basically this kind of a bump attractors for the working memory network and also for the PPC network. And there is a basically kind of a one-to-one -one mapping from the PPC network into working memory network. And the only difference between this, these two networks is that the integration time of PPC is much slower than working memory, right? That, that's a way for us to basically kind of um, 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 uh, model these sensory history. Okay, so PPC, both of them, they receive input, sensory input. PPC inter integrates it much slower and, um, and then kind of sends this, this um, slow integrated sensory input to the working memory network. So if you look at um, how basically this, this, uh, this network um, operates, at the time of the first stimulus presentation, okay, the working memory network, it's basically hovering somewhere random, okay? This is before the stimulus one. The stimulus one arrives and then working memory network jumps into that. So it's a new bump representing the, 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 the first stimulus. Then the stimulus one disappears. This is a kind of a, a um, 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 attractor network. The bump stays around that, okay? And, and then until the second stimulus arrives and it responds to the second stimulus and the way that we are basically reading, reading out this network is by taking out the activity at this time T1 and T, T2 to look at the difference between the two. So this is a case of a stable memory, meaning that the working memory is not really affected by the, the, the input from the PPC network. But we can imagine now volatile, the, the volatile memory of S1 in the working memory network. So here again, I'm showing you example of two stimuli. The first stimulus and S2 are very close to each other. S1 is smaller than S2. So now on this, in this scenario, the working uh, memory network jumps to the, the, to the place of the first stimulus, but now it is kind of influenced by the input from PPC and PPC input can kind of pushes, can push this into a new place where PPC dictates where to go. And now this new location of the bump, right? The, where we kind of look at the, uh, when we, we want to read out and make a decision, this new bump is going to give us a different result because this S hat of um, uh, S hat one, right? This new memory of the first stimulus is now actually larger than S2. So this is a, this is a basically an example of bias minus, but we can also have bias plus situations, meaning that where PPC dictates and uh, a working memory to bump to move to, now this new location is basically increases the distance between the between S2 and the memory of the first stimulus, and therefore it kind of um, uh, increases the chances of of, of uh, correct answer. So it, it's it's producing bias plus. And when we look at the performance of our model, 
on uh, these um, different um, uh, um, stimulus pairs and also this kind of a history um, a heat map, uh, you see that it's very similar um, to our real data, meaning that if you look at the plot on the left, um, when we move from um, um, smaller values of S1 to larger value, the performance uh, decreases for the red boxes and performance increases for the blue boxes. And that's basically very similar to the data, except for that, I'm sorry, the, the colors are switched. Um, but uh, it's basically kind of the same pattern, right? This asymmetry of the, of the, of the performance on this stimulus, um, uh, stimulus set. And very clear modulation by the previous trial, the identity of the pre previous trial, as you can see in the, in the heat map plots. The, the y-axis, there's a clear modulation by the y-axis, and that's the, the immediate previous trial. Okay, so what is exactly happening in this, um, in this um, task? The thing is that, as I said, in some trials, memory bump survives. It's not volatile and it, memory bump doesn't move around and gives us a kind of a faithful representation of the memory. But then in some other trials, the memory bump jumps to where sensory history input is, to where PPC tells it where to go, right? And mathematically speaking, at each trial, so we do have these pairs of uh, the pair of a stimuli S one T S two T at trial um, T, and there is one minus epsilon chance of basically um, uh, uh, non volatile memory, meaning that S one T actually this should be S hat um, uh, um, um, one and S two will give us the correct comparison, right? But then there is an epsilon chance that actually this new, um, uh, this, this memory is, is volatile and S hat is now moved to somewhere new. Where can it move? It can move either in a new place that would still give us the right classification or move somewhere that now would give us the wrong classification, right? And where this S hat goes depends on basically distribution of the bump location in PPC network, okay? So if you have a kind of a uniform sampling of all these pairs of stimuli here, this is what we are going to get as a marginal distribution of stimuli, okay? And, and so this is the marginal distribution of stimuli. The distribution of pi, the bump location over PPC is very similar to this, but it's kind of narrower because PPC is now kind of slowly integrating this. So if you kind of want to uh, graphically present that again we have this stimulus set and we are now showing just this kind of a distribution of bumps over pi basically marginal bump location in PPC network and this is the ideal performance right this is what we wanted to have but now if this um, uh, uh, um, 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 stimulus is going to move look at the 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 uh, darkest red box Okay, so here it's darkest red box because if, it's, if it moves, it's going to move somewhere on this distribution. And most of the places on this distribution, the ones that are on the right side, side of the diagonal, they are still going to give us the correct answer, right? So this, this kind of a influence of the PPC network or the history network is not going to have much of an impact on this one. But let's move up a little bit. As you see that now that we move, the, the possible wrong location, which means that the part of this distribution on the left side of the diagonal is just like increasing, right? right? So these pairs of the stimuli, they have higher chance of moving somewhere, which is a wrong place for the comparison, right? Similarly, for this stimuli on the, on the, uh, on, um, above the diagonal line, right? As we move down, now we are basically increasing the this red section, which means that the places that if this, this the stimulus moves to, it's going to give us a wrong comparison. And that will just like, that is the, the reason that we are getting this kind of a gradual um, 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 shift in the behavior in the average performance, okay? So summary two here is to show that our continuous attractor model for PPC, which is a st uh, slow integrator, um, can basically replicate almost all behavioral results that we had in our human and rat experiments. And this model suggests that this short-term history bias, which means that 
um, kind of a drift to it's basically just a kind of a jump toward the most recent past can produce the, this seemingly contraction toward the mean effect that we observe it as a, on, on the kind of an average performance, right? So this contraction bias toward the mean is basically just an, an average effect over many trials. Whereas in each single trial, the volatile working memory jumps towards the input from the history network. And I think this is a, that was actually a very interesting surprise for me because I really started thinking about a, uh, uh, this phenomenon of contraction bias uh, and, and under a very Bayesian framework. And I really would, would wanted to kind of go after finding some sort of a uh, um, 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 mechanism in the brain that, compute, that would compute this kind of a Bayesian um, um, uh, um, um, inference. But it, it turns out we don't need that really. Like right? mechanistically, we can have some operations that are completely non-Bayesian, but then on the level of behavior, basically they give us um, some sort of a, um, um, uh, interesting uh, properties um, 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 that fit very well under the Bayesian framework, right? So it's just basically this kind of a confusion between does brain do Bayesian computation explicitly, or basically we can basically uh, model the brain function and the behavior and cognitive outputs in a Bayesian framework, right? So I can either stop here or uh, tell you a little bit more about um, the next things that we are trying to kind of uh, dig into in terms of the uh, memory recall and the impact of the priors in the memory recall. Um, Jenny, you told me I can totally stop here or I can uh, talk for like four or five more minutes. I think there are quite a few okay, questions. So, so if you'd like to, if we want to have a bit of a discussion, sure. we should sure. probably move to them. Although it's quite tantalizing. I can just, like, briefly, like, excuse <laughs> me, just let's say that. So in the working memory task that I talked that. to you about so far, the output is basically binary. So remember something, compare it to the second stimulus, tell me whether it is the, 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 um, they are either similar or, dif or different or larger or smaller, right? So it's just a kind of a binary comparison. And we are kind of throwing out a lot of information about the nature of the memory. So in new t in, in other tasks that we are uh, um, uh, working on in the, in, the, in the lab, we are focusing on a kind of a memory reconstruction task that would give us some continuous readout into the memory. And we are having it easily for humans, but Peter Vincent, PhD student in the lab, he is heroically basically uh, translating this in, in rats and mice. But we also have some other special working memory tests in rats that they would show this very interesting um, um, uh, uh, readout into the, um, uh, to the uh, memory. So that's it. By that, I stop here and I thank all the members of, of, of um, uh, Lim Lab and um, uh, also all the collaborators that I do have um, at Gatsby, SWC, uh, Imperial College. Thank you so much for your attention. You get the sad clapping of one person. Thank you, Athena, that was beautiful. Um, okay, let's move to some questions. So um, one question, so I'm sort of going by the number of votes questions have, can you scale the magnitude of the contraction bias with the variance of the stimuli? Ah, uh, that's a really great question. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I, I completely understand what they mean by the variance of a stimuli. But um, does it mean so? Um, but definitely, we can kind of change the variance of that noisy memory, right? For instance, by increasing delay interval. That's exactly what we were trying to do. By the, when we, we increase the delay interval, the contraction bias clearly in, uh, 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 um, uh, gets stronger. And our interpretation of that is that the memory becomes basically, if you do have some sort of a kind of a uh, distribution over that memory, it becomes, the variance increases, it becomes noisier and therefore stronger um, influenced by the, uh, by, by this prior or under this, this kind of a mechanistic model that we are proposing, the memory becomes more volatile, that bump in the working memory network becomes more volatile and it's therefore kind of easier for the TPC to, to move it around. So we, we definitely do have that. We, um, uh, we have also some data when we are basically changing the distribution, how we are sampling the stimuli in this range, 
Now I showed you results from a uniform distribution, but we can totally change the, the uh, distribution. And it seems, um, uh, yes, that changes what uh, contraction bias as well. Hmm. Interesting. So a uh, question from Anne Uri. Were the individual differences in rat behavior dominated by neural responses to sensory history? Or could you also predict individual tendencies towards repeating choices or rewards? Oh, fantastic question. Shame on me that I haven't looked at that. I do have the data, but I haven't looked at that. I should. That's a great question. The only thing that I can say that um, uh, it seems perturbing PPC didn't really change the, uh, uh, the choice history or the reward history biases. Okay, even if I could totally decode choice history and reward history from PPC. Okay, so and then later on, when in another data set, another behavior, I kind of uh, um, uh, looked in a kind of a comparative way, uh, looked at sensory history versus choice history in PPC, FOF, and striatum. It seems that. This, this, these um, uh, sensory history and, and choice history are present on all these three networks, but the strongest uh, sensory history is presented in PPC and the strongest choice history was presented in FOF. So I say that, meaning I want to say that it seems kind of a choice, these are distributed. It's more about like which area might have a stronger influence, right? Which area might be more of a kind of a bottleneck in terms of, of uh, downstream behavior. For sensory history, I'm pretty sure PPC is pretty important, but it seems for choice history, PPC is not as important as possibly other brain areas like FOF. Interesting. So um, a question from Megan Peters. If the contraction bias is due to drift towards a prior, could you use dropout lines in a computational psychiatry approach to explore hypo prior models, e.g. of autism and other failures in Bayesian inference in various psychiatric disorders? That's a great at... question, Megan. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually, there are uh, already some works um, into that. Uh, to be honest, um, so when I, when I first really saw uh, the result, my very first, I really didn't know about any of this when I started uh, um, doing my inactivation experiments in PPC. I really wanted to go after just like maintenance mechanism underlying working memory, and I wanted to focus that. And then the very first set of data that I, I, I collected was um, um, sharpening of the psychometric, right? Which was mind blowing for me. What is going on? There is something wrong. And the thing that kind of helped me a lot to um, um, understand what's going on and put together pieces of, 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 of um, a puzzle was some work from a dyslexia and autism related to contraction bias. And they are works mainly done by Mira Fahisar. And uh, she has basically a kind of a theory about like um, uh, dyslexia, but now she's looking into autism. Now I'm collaborating with her actually. We're looking into like um, 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 autism, schizophrenia, and dyslexia and uh, it seems that like they do show different types of contraction biases types meaning that um, at the first glance glance it seems like dyslexic um, uh, uh, people they don't show contraction bias at all and she has a theory that she calls it kind of an anchoring um, 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 theory that like um, dyslexic um, uh, uh, people cannot anchor themselves into predictions from the past because they can't basically build those predictions because they cannot integrate okay this is the basically and and um so she has done some works uh behaviorally before on this on these groups and uh, very recently there is actually a nature neuroscience paper together with manish sahani comparison between neurotypicals um autistic and dyslexic in terms of time scale of contraction bias so uh, it seems both dyslexia and uh, um, um, autistic, they, they, they show different um, way of um, integrating past compared to neurotypicals, meaning that uh, one group, um, um, uh, autistic group, weighs uh, um, uh, um, uh, strongly the immediate past and not longer one, and, and autism is the other way around. So there has been now some kind of a uh, uh, definitely 
some interest in kind of understanding possible um, um, uh, phenotypes um, in different psychiatric uh, disorders that might point into different use of the sensory history, different use of priors. That's super interesting. Okay, I'm going to have to close this session or I'm going to get in big trouble with the other organizers. Um, thank you again for a really beautiful talk and um, also lots of food for thought there in the questions. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everyone. It was thank a pleasure you. to be here. Thank you. Bye.